I don't want no oil A spoil in my shoreline I like fish much better than crud I like birds and things A creeping and crawling Won't trade no more oil for blood The sun don't give us all we need To make this country run but that black demon oil's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. I don't want them nukes run by them kooks who think radioactivity is fun. No more three-headed frogs or kids with leukemia. Nuclear power ain't fit. Son, don't give us all we need to make this country run. But that nuclear power's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. No news. Good morning, Toledo, and good afternoon, Columbus. And hello to Bowling Green and to everyone on the internet, wherever and whenever you are. My name is Joe DeMar, and I'm here with my incredible co-host, Rebecca Wood. Yes, and together Rebecca and I are going to craft yet another wonderful hour of radio called For a Green Future. For a Green Future is a show where we talk about ecology and the environment. And we talk about it in the ways that it affects you, your wealth, your health, your happiness, the wealth and health and happiness of your friends and your families and the trees and the cicadas that are emerging and the little box turtles that eat the cicadas and pretty much everybody and everything because, like it or not, we're all together on this wonderful planet called Earth. we got a great show lined up for you today and uh, we're going to just chat for another 15 minutes or so. Then uh, no, no guests this week, but we're going to take an in-depth look. We're going to dive into um, the latest threat to our forests, which is uh, something called beech leaf disease. And uh, we're going to take a look at that. And then we're going to hear from our sponsors, our advertisers and patrons. And then we'll hear from Rebecca. And Rebecca, what will you be talking about this week? Hurricanes. Hurricanes. Very timely. Yes. Kind of subject there. All right. There's a reason for that. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. It's uh, tomorrow's the start. No, today is the start of Hurricane Preparedness Week. Oh, all right. Well, and uh, the, the, my, my research confirms you should, in fact, pre prepare for them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well. If this is news to you, I'm not sure we can help you. <laughs> all right. And then uh, after that, it's ecological news. And uh, we have... We have a milestone in ecological news this week that uh, we're going to get to with our very first story. So something interesting to think about. And of course, at some point, we hope to hear from you. And uh, we welcome call-ins at 877-909-1007. That's 877-909-1007. And you can talk about any ecological topic. It doesn't have to be something we've covered might be a question you've got about ecology, you know, why does this animal do that? And we, Rebecca and I will do our best to answer because we know a lot of environmental trivia, right? We've been... Totally. Or <laughs> yeah, at least by next week, we'll attempt to answer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. So, uh, you know, this morning it was, it was pretty foggy out. It was uh, in down there in Bowling Green as I was prepping for the show. Most of that has burned off by now. I'm seeing... But uh, we are still, one little thing to note, we're still nine degrees above average for today. And uh, this is how it's been going pretty much all year, nine, you know, 10 to 20 degrees above average. And then you get a day that's like five or six degrees below average, and then you go back to 10 to 20 degrees above average. So, you know, global warming is happening, you know, even though there's still the den deniers out there. Uh, but it's nice weather. <laughs> It's good weather to get outside in and uh last night just before the big thunderstorms that were man those were something weren't they mm -hmm. 
Yeah. It's pretty impressive. I, uh, well, the I, night before the last was the one with all the lighting, lightning, right? Well, no, last night was had a lot okay. of lightning, too. I, I mean, saw a lot of rain last night. Yeah, no, well, I was, uh, actually, I was in the Mommy Indoor Theater last night. I, I went there. There was a, uh, a benefit for a nonprofit called um, Nature's Nursery, which is a uh, rehabilitation for uh, injured wildlife. And so uh, it was three comics and they did a, a, a benefit a benefit performance for them. And while we were in there, the thunder, you know, we could hear the thunder coming through the walls from the uh, from the huge storm that was happening. And All heck broke loose. <laughs> yes, and, and of course the, the comics just integrated that into yes. their, you know. As they do. Right, <laughs> into their performance, you know, with the whole God doesn't approve of that punchline, I guess, uh, joke. And uh, it was it was a nice night. And, you know, as an ecologist, I've always been a little kind of on the fence about wildlife rehab places because obviously you want, as a human, you find an injured wildlife, you want it to get better and thrive, you know, if you have any sympathy for creatures. Um, but I, I've always been a little bit like, eh, is that kind of messing with the whole uh survival of the fittest thing but uh, one of the points they made in the presentation was that almost all the animals that they rehab almost all the injured animals they find have been injured by humans yep yeah so it's like collisions with cars or uh, animals that have ingested poison because people poisoned the mice or the rats and then the predators eat the mice and the rats and they get poisoned uh, so those so that you know, ecologically speaking, that's perfectly fine. <laughs> yeah. So I was glad I went. And it was uh, it was pretty funny. You know, there were three comics there and they did a great job. Uh, there was only one point at which I was actually, really actually offended. And that was uh, one of the comics was making jokes about deaf people. And uh, my son is hard of hearing. And his whole presentation, it started out great. He ta was talking about he got it. A deaf girlfriend and he had learned sign language to communicate with her and I was like yeah I was clapping uh, but then he started going into the you know the typical jokes about deaf people and I was like yeah but uh, other than that I was you know it was a good night other than that and uh, <laughs> one of the one of the routines that one of the comics did was uh, talking about snowmobiles and he didn't like them. He, he, he hated snowmobiles. And I was, I've always been kind of, yeah, down They're very on... loud when you live in the country. Exactly. And they're in a like, nearby field or something. And you're like, oh, geez, it's Sunday morning. Be quiet. Yeah, exactly. And, and where, I, where I lived, out in western New York, uh, they would be going all night. Literally, they'd be out there at 2 or 3 in the morning. Wow. And... Uh, I actually, you know, at that age, I actually used to go out cross-country skiing at 2 and 3 in the morning when there was like a full mood because, let me tell you, being out there on cross-country skis at 2 in the morning when there's a full mood and lots of snow on the ground, it's like magical. It's like a whole nother world. Uh, really pretty. But these <laughs> snowmobilers would always come and you know, they would see my tracks and they'd be like, who's out skiing at this hour? And they'd like chase me on their snowmobiles and oh, God. circle around me. And I'd, I'd be like, you know, just keep moving, guys. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, they didn't, it was all curiosity. They weren't actually purposely harassing me, but it was still pretty unpleasant. But as he was telling all the, these jokes about snowmobiles and mocking out snowmobiles, which I totally agreed with, <laughs> uh, I couldn't help but think, that hasn't happened down here in a long time. We haven't really had a winter yeah. with enough snow to to handle snowmobiles. True. And it was it was really kind of bizarre. And and so I actually looked it up, and it turned out that uh, the snowmo snowmobile industry is in fact dying. Wow. Uh, last year, profits were down fifty percent from for uh, the biggest snowmobile manufacturer, the ones that make. Uh, the skidoos, uh, and so this year they're cutting production by thirty percent, and so they're they're shifting, uh, you know, wonderful capitalism. They're they're 
they're shifting over to making just powered vehicles, you know, like the four wheelers and the side by sides that can uh, just run around in the, you know, without with snow, wheels. with wheels. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the one thing about snowmobiles, though, is they don't really contribute much to uh, erosion because you're on top of the snow, you know, so you're not digging up the ground that much, a little bit here and there. But uh, these four-wheelers can really do a lot of damage in terms of running stuff over and creating deep ruts in the ground and, and causing all kinds of damage. So this is not a good, might be a perfectly fine shift economically, but ecologically, it's not so good. Um, yeah, but the, so the power sports industry, though, is uh, looking like it's in trouble. And it's just one of many ways that global warming is is affecting things is changing things and so it really snowmobiles are becoming quickly becoming one of those way things used to be you know because there's more and more as global warming progresses and accelerates we're getting to the point where we're we have to say you know there used to be <laughs> These little things that had, you know, they had tractors on the back and they had this little skis in the front and they could go like 30, 40 miles an hour. How um, long until until you say snowmobile and young people have no idea what you're talking about? You know, they already, there's about 10 years after the cell phone uh, when you could still, when you wanted to know the time, you still looked at your, held your wrist up and looked at it and asked somebody <laughs> what time it is. Mm -hmm, and then that mm -hmm. stopped working. Right. Yeah. Or, you know calling time and temperature on the telephone. <laughs> right. Remember doing that? Yeah, yeah I remember. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you have people today, you hand them, you, you show them a, a dial phone and they're like, uh, you know, what is this thing with the two little things at either end attached to a cord? Yeah, so, but uh, unfortunately, this, this brings us to our next segment of the show. One of the things that's rapidly becoming uh, the way things used to be or we have to talk about it in terms of the way things used to be, is uh, our forests. And most of us listening to the show are still remember ash trees. Remember ash trees? Yep, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're gone now. Yep. But uh, it was just 2002 when the emerald ash borer showed up. And now here we are just a little over 20 years later and they're, they're pretty much gone. And uh, unfortunately, the latest tree, I just discovered this latest tree that's uh, looking like it's going to get added to the way things used to be list are beech trees. Yeah. Yeah. And this is a really big deal because beech trees are incredibly important in a forest ecosystem. They're, they're nice big trees and they provide a lot of shade. And in fact, one of the things about beech trees is that they can germinate effectively and grow in a fully shaded forest. So they, wow. they fill in nicely in deep forest. Uh, but they're very, also very important in terms of food. There's uh, one thing that or almost everything eats beech nuts. <laughs> okay, yeah. yeah. Not, uh, not sharks or octopuses. Uh, no, well, but I'll, although if, some fell in the water. I'm yeah, sure they, true. Yeah. They try the octopuses, at and least there are vegetarian them. sharks, in fact, that just are oh. filter feeders. So, oh, there you go. Theoretically, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, amongst uh, mammals, we got uh, mice, squirrels, chipmunks, bears. Okay, uh, beech nuts are a very important food source for bears, uh, deer, and fox. And then amongst the birds, uh, grouse, ducks, blue jays. And they were an essential food for passenger pigeons, um, which, you know, interestingly, if, if somebody ever decides to use genetic engineering or whatever and bring passenger pigeons back from extinction, uh, they're going to have to find something like beech nuts to live on. Wow. And if beech nuts are gone, you might not be able to bring them back, even if you have, you know, the full Jurassic Park laboratory. Mm. And of course, humans. Uh, beech nuts have long been an important food source for humans. They're incredibly nutritious. Uh, the, the nut is actually 50% fat and 20% protein, hmm. which is... Uh, that's good. Yeah, that's a lot of protein in a, in a little nut. Of course, beaches also provide excellent shelter because they're so huge. Uh, things, lots of birds nest in them. Uh, if they get hollowed out, 
by, uh, you know, if they become hollow, then they provide shelter for bats and, uh, and birds like woodpeckers and other cavity dwellers. They're an incredibly important species. Oh, and also Budweiser beer depends on beech trees. I don't know if oh you knew this. Yeah. Yeah. The, you, you see that little, some of the ads, you know, you, you see the words beech wood aged. Right. Yeah. They literally take chunks of beech wood and put them into the tub, into the vats with the beer as it's uh, fermenting. And that adds a really a nice flavor to the thing. It also helps encourage the, the yeast, the yeast like living on the, the little beech wood wood and that helps the whole process. So, uh, so if you like beer, if you like, yeah. and if you like bud, uh, you should be cared, concerned about this, uh, this beech leaf disease. And uh, the beech leaf disease is apparently being caused by a, a nematode. And the nema, nematodes are roundworms. And so it's kind of ironic that one of the biggest multicellular organisms in a forest, because beech trees can get to be really huge, is being wiped out by one of the smallest multicellular organisms in the forest. Specifically, let's see if we get the, the name here. They found that this, uh, oh, well, let's talk a little bit more about uh, nematodes in general, though. Uh, nematodes are their own uh, phylum, which is just, you know, two down from kingdom. And there's millions and millions of species of nematodes. And they, they range in size. The, the biggest nematode, <laughs> this is a little gross here, biggest nematode, uh, which is, you know, they're also called roundworms because they're not segmented like, uh, like an earthworm. They're right, smooth. Right. Uh, the biggest nematode is 20 feet long. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, and that, uh, they are found, those nematodes are found inside whales. They're a whale parasite. Wow. Yeah. And uh, the smallest nematode is only 80 microns long. My heavens. Yeah, 80 microns is one, or approximately one twenty thousandth of an inch. So, um, <laughs> they really have a huge spectrum wow. in terms of sizes. They're all pretty much built the same way, though. They're all, you know, cylindrical with a pointy end and a rounded end. Uh, and the pointy end's got the mouth. And uh, you would think that because they are all kind of the same build, even though they just vary hugely in size, that they would all kind of pretty much eat everything. But they can all, they're all can be extremely specialized. Yeah. Yeah. Most nematodes uh, eat things like bacteria and fungi in the soil. So like if you take a shovel full of dirt, there are literally millions of individual nematodes in there. And as we said, there's millions of species and we've only named a couple thousand out of those million. Um, but, you know, in addition to eating bacteria and fungi, they also eat things, uh, they can also be parasites. That's the, probably what we're most familiar with uh, roundworms in our lives is that they have parasites like hookworm and trichinosis. Some beneficial nematode parasites, uh, there's a nematode that eats termites and they eat them from the inside out, which is kind of gross, but very handy if you want to protect your house. And you can actually buy packages of nematodes and put them in the soil around your house and it wow. keeps the, you know, they'll, they'll eat the termites that are trying that try to colonize your house. So that's kind of nice. But in this particular case, uh, these nematodes are attacking beech trees. Now, this species that's attacking the beech trees was unknown and unnamed before they discovered them here in Ohio. So <laughs> this is a, a homegrown uh, infection. We had, we had the very first appearance and they were, appeared in, over in Lake County, yeah. o, over there by Cleveland, in the parks actually, was when they were very first identified in 2012. This nematode has since been named and uh, I have the name here in my notes somewhere. Oh, there it is. Lytic lencus cranetia macane. And macane is M-C-C-A-N-N-I-I, -I, which is probably named after the person who discovered them. And uh, one thing, if you're somebody who in your life 
one of your life goals is to get a species named after you, go into the roundworms, you know, because there's <laughs> literally billions of them left to name. So you pretty well be confident you could get one named after you. Um, so anyway, this uh, apparently these might be coming from Japan uh, because they've also been found there. And they were probably brought over in the roots of an ornamental that somebody bought. And it, it's really just another example of how this global trade system we've set up has costing us much, much more long term than any of the short term profit that people make by importing this stuff from from overseas. I mean, we're ignoring biology in favor of economy and it's it's actually breaking us. It's because it's not really even efficient. I mean, like, OK, it's efficient economically, but not in terms of energy or anything else, because like. They're, they're having things assembled wherever they can do it, wherever there's no union, basically, wherever unions are severely repressed, right? Yeah, it's I mean, drive it down wages. And in this case... That's why you got, like, oh, let's make the parts over here and then ship them over here to be assembled and then ship, ship it back that way, where it, you know, yeah. some other direction or where it came from. Yeah, so even locally, economically, it's not a benefit. But in this, in this case, somebody saw a picture of some kind of shrub from Japan, a pretty flower or something, and said, oh, I've got to have that in my garden. Somebody brought it over from Japan, it got planted, the nematodes got out, and now they're busily wiping out the, all the beech trees in, in North America. Uh -oh. And so whatever, you know, $500 or $10,000 or even a million dollars that that importer made making that sale uh, pales in comparison to the, the loss we're all gonna suffer if they succeed in wiping out all the beech trees. and. When the first colonists came to the United States or came to North America before all these, in, these invasive species were introduced, the descriptions of the abundance of animal and plant life were just incredible. I mean, literally all our rivers in the springtime would be masses of froth because millions upon millions of fish would come up to spawn. Uh, letters from colonists back to England describing the wildlife here, they said there were there were wild turkeys behind every tree. <laughs> and, you know, if, like at that time, three quarters of the trees in your forest are chestnuts or beech trees, that's tons of food. So it's entirely possible that really wasn't an exaggeration. But um, this is just the, the latest and one of the, the most important uh, tree species that's being threatened. And so far, we literally just figured out what was killing these trees. Um, and we don't, there's no treatment, you know, nobody's been able to figure out anything. One thing that I'm, I'm kind of upset about is this is just another example where the, the invasive species showed up. The biologists identified it pretty quickly. They identified it when it was in a single park in Lake County. And then the response is, okay, well now we're gonna watch it. <laughs> uh, yay. We're gonna monitor this. <laughs> and they've monitored it as these uh, nematodes have spread all the way from Cleveland. And interestingly, they've spread east and south. They haven't spread west yet much, which is why we still have some beech trees. So if you've got a nice beech tree in your yard, you know, go out and appreciate it now because they're starting to spread this way, but they've pretty much gone around Lake Erie counterclockwise, which is interesting. They headed, they headed west, and they headed up around Buffalo, and now they're up in Ontario. But there are not many yet in uh, Michigan or Ohio, which is which is interesting. Which is one reason I, this is the first time I heard about beech leaf disease. So um, it's a hundred percent mortality so far is what it looks like. Uh, it seems to be spread in root systems when they're because sometimes beech trees reproduce by cloning they the roots send up new shoots that become full-fledged trees the big symptom is that the leaves appear to have stripes on them dark stripes and uh, inside those stripes are hundreds of thousands of these nematodes and one infected leaf can have inside it hundreds of thousands of nematodes that can then transfer to other trees uh, they, they seem to need water to transfer, so, uh, but it looks like they might be hitching rides on birds and, 
and other animals. Uh, so the beech tree, it looks like, is going to join uh, a lot of other trees that have uh, perished. Of course, Ameri starting with the chestnut way yep, back. American chestnut, biggest, uh, most important example. Ash trees, which we mentioned. Also, I, I just discovered that butternuts have a disease that's wiping them out. Wow. And I, I also did not know that, but apparently butternuts are, are pretty well doomed in North America. So it's just, it's really depressing that our regulations and our, our laws and our economies, our economics haven't taken in this very basic fact <laughs> that if you bring diseases in from other continents, it can wipe out species over in your entire continent. And you remember how you couldn't find anything during the pandemic? And because mm -hmm. I don't know, supply chain, blah, blah, big boat in Egypt or whatever. That, that, that's because partly everything is made so far away. Yeah. From where it's going to be sold. Right. So even economically, this global... That didn't need to happen. Right. This global economic system is, is not good for the planet, or it's not good for your pocketbook either. That's why we always say here in For a Green Future, we're talking about how these things affect your wealth, your health, and your happiness. And uh, literally, our economy is inextricably linked to the health of our ecosystems, because the more impoverished your ecosystem, the poorer the people who live in that ecosystem are. It's just very straightforward. So, so that's pretty much it. So alerted you folks about beech leaf disease, which, uh, you know, we're about to lose one of the most important trees in the deciduous forest. And so taking 15 minutes to kind of dive into that so that you know what's going on. I think that was worth it. You know, even though we didn't have a guest this week, I think this is the kind of information you're probably not going to get pretty much anywhere else right now. So. True. I've not heard it anyplace else. Yeah. Okay. So now on to our advertisers and patrons to whom we are eternally grateful. For a Green Future is also brought to you by the Wood County Park District. The Wood County Park District is a natural resources conservation agency. They protect natural spaces, maintain quality green spaces, provide engaging programming, and they teach people to love and respect nature. They also restore wildlife habitats and lead people on outdoor adventures. Wood County Parks protects natural spaces in Wood County for all to enjoy from 8 a.m. to 30 minutes past sunset every day of the year. There are several ways to get a hold of them and find out what's happening. One is to call them at 419-353-1897. Another is to visit their website, www.wcparks.org. The website, again, is at www wcparks.org. They are also available on all social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and many others. Just search for WC Parks. That's the Wood County Park District, and we're very grateful for their support. Yes, we certainly are. And we're also grateful to our patrons. And patrons are incredibly generous people who've gone to patreon.com. Uh, there they searched for our Patreon page. They just searched for For a Green Future up popped that Patreon page. They looked at all the different membership levels. They picked one of the membership levels or they made their own level uh, based on how much they could afford. And so every month a little bit comes out of their account and comes over to us. And that's how we could afford to keep this show on the air. So thank you so much to our patrons. And thank you, Rebecca, for every week enlightening us with a, a different topic. What are we talking about this week? Okay, well, in honor of National Hurricane Preparedness Week, we're going to talk about hurricanes. Uh, the official name for apparently the most accepted international name is Tropical Cyclone for a hurricane, although they are called Typhoons, Hurricanes, Tropical Storms, Cyclonic Storms, Tropical Depressions, uh, Cyclones, or Cyclones, depending on their strength and location. Uh, people in different parts of the world like to call them different things, and, you know, it has to get up to a certain level of destructiveness before it gets another name. And uh, it, it uh, first thing you read when you look up tropical cyclones is that it is, that it is a type of disaster, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it, it kind of sounds like a drink, doesn't it? Like you'd go into a bar and 
A so little, give me yeah. a tropical cyclone. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. but, but uh. yeah, no, you don't want those. <laughs> if Poseidon's at the at the uh, at the at the bar, don't ask for a tropical cyclone. Check. Definitely not. He might give you one. Uh huh. Um, so yeah, it's a defined as a rapidly rotating storm with a low pressure center, strong winds, a spiral arrangement of thunderstorms in a closed low level atmosphere circulation. So the atmosphere is cir circulating in this kind of closed pattern, I guess, is what that would be. Uh, in order to qualify as a hurricane, it has to have hurricane force winds, which is 75 miles per hour. Um, the one good thing that they do, which is important for the planet, is that they carry heat from the tropics and spread it out to temperate areas. If hurricanes didn't do this, everything in the tropics would cook and we'd freeze to death, basically. Uh -huh. So there's a reason. They're ki it's kind of a safety valve for the Earth, if you think about it. Hmm. And uh, they typically form over bodies of warm water, like oceans mostly. Mostly hmm. oceans. So some ecological problems with hurricanes is they, they can contribute to shore erosion. Apparently Andrew eroded 75% of the sand from Louisiana's uh, barrier islands. Oh, wow. And so there's no beach anymore. Very sad. Uh, of course, they contribute to sea level rise because they erode things down. And uh, yeah, they can strip vegetation and kill mangrove key trees. I guess this happened, uh, happened in the Keys a while back, the Florida Keys. Uh, they cause freshwater flooding. And generally, you know, they, they, they mix up the fresh and salt water. And that's bad if you are some kind of a fish that can't tolerate too much fresh water or too much salt water. You know, fish are adapted, all sea creatures, to for a certain level of salinity. There's a range with a lot of them, but if you go outside that range, that's that organism is in trouble. And this is a very sudden change, obviously. It's not something that they can, you know, just kind of drift away from or something. Uh, they contribute to lower salinity and oxygen levels uh, and rapid temperature changes, also all bad for sea creatures who can't adapt fast enough to what's happening. Um, and then, of course, there's oil and debris pollutants, uh, or, or I, this is a new word, anthropogenic sources. Ooh, pollutants yeah. from anthropogenic sources. Uh, and that's uh, us. yeah, that's basically us. Also, they can disrupt food change and alter nutrient cycles, like coral reefs and mangrove uh, mangrove forests, for example, are, are very vulnerable to rapid changes like that. Can be destroyed, and uh, so yeah, you know, they're destructive to begin with. They have a good purpose, but they're destructive to begin with, and can destroy organisms, uh, lots of them, and. Um, uh, then the problem, the main problem, though, is that stuff, they hit human stuff, and human stuff is dirty. <laughs> yeah. And it spreads all that around. So this is why hurricanes are a problem. Mm-hmm. And they're getting stronger. They are, yes. For the global warming. And so, yeah. All right. Well, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> so, and um, so in terms of preparedness, I guess... Uh, the usual stuff, bottled water, maybe some battery backup power, that sort of thing. Probably so. Maybe evacuate if the authorities tell you to. Oh, yeah. Don't hesitate if they say. Yeah. Yeah. Get, and the, get the heck out of there. Right. Okay. Well, thanks, Rebecca. You're welcome. Now, on to ecological news. And our first story, uh, as I said, this is a milestone for us. And the reason this is a milestone is that this comes from an actual press release that was sent directly to us. So this is like the first time we've sort of been acknowledged as a news program. Wow. <laughs> yeah, cool. and it's not from just any old, you know, PR firm or something. This came to us directly from the International Renewable Energy Agency. Hot diggity. Or IRENA. And IRENA is a, an organization, it's an international organization that was created to promote renewable energy, and that includes bioenergy, geothermal, hydro, ocean wave energy, solar energy, and wind power. 168 countries plus the European Union contribute to IRENA. And um, the, the title of this uh, press release was G7 Countries Take IRENA, Task IRENA 
to monitor groups' renewable energy progress. And we reported on this in the past that back at the G7 or back in the COP28, uh, a whole bunch of countries, over 100 countries, committed to tripling their renewable energy. Well, what the countries in the G7 have done is they've gone to IRENA and said, okay, we're making you the referee. You know, you're the one we're going to share with you all our data, and you're the one who's going to produce a report every year <clears throat> to say if we're on track or if we're falling behind, or basically if we're living up to our promises. Right. Which is good. That's good. It's a good organization. They, they put out a lot of excellent information, and they have, you know, they're stable. They've got a good budget. They've got a lot of people. And uh, the director general, a fellow by the name of Francesco La Camera, uh, says trust and transparency go hand in hand. And so they're going to, the promise is that the IRENA will track the G7 members' progress towards the global climate uh, target to triple renewable energy by 2030, which is rapidly approaching. So, uh, so their preliminary estimates just right now are that the world is on track to triple the amount of solar power, that solar is going up fast enough. Uh, wind power is a little bit behind, and specifically it's behind because they need to accelerate the infrastructure that is create the transmission lines that will carry wind from really windy remote places into places like uh, the cities and where there's more population. Um, they're also focused on something called APRA, which is the Accelerated Partnership for Renewables in Africa. And the ministers, this all happened at the ministers' meeting on climate, energy, and the environment, which was uh, this past month over in Italy, which was a very nice uh, place. And they sent me a nice little picture, a little group shot of all the ministers that came to the, you know, the ministers' meeting. Unfortunately, Italy at this meeting or afterwards <laughs> suggested that they might be willing to look at nuclear power as one of the strategies. Um, the last time Italy voted on nuclear power, more than 98% of Italians voted against nuclear power. So, and more than once, nuclear power has been kind of a, a third rail, as they say, for politicians in Italy, because what happens is that the, the tiny little number of ultra-rich billionaires who love nuclear power, like get in there and try to influence a politician to say, oh, bring back nukes, bring back nukes, because that way they make lots more money. Uh, and then the politician tries it, and then he fails miserably, and it's sort of like the end of his political career. So uh, apparently this guy has forgotten that, that cycle in Italy. Uh, unfortunately, also, it seems that this cycle, once the Italians start considering it, like both for Chernobyl and for Fukushima, it got put on the ballot, and then the disaster happened, and then the uh, vote came. Oops, uh, yeah. <laughs> Which kind of explains why, you know, it was 98% plus, because that vote, that second vote came, this is would be the third time Italians would be asked to vote on nukes and the second time was literally a few weeks after the Fukushima disaster. So uh, let's hope it doesn't get that far this time. Let's hope Italy is just kind of like, you know, well, we we don't need to do that again. <laughs> you know, we've done it twice. We don't want to jinx the planet again. So uh, that's enough of that. Yeah, that's enough. But uh, it's good news that Irina is being tasked with uh, being the, the watchdog on this, the cop on the beat, so to speak. So uh, looking forward to their reports. Next report, we head off to Australia. And we've talked before about how the state of South Australia is one of the biggest uh, electrical grids in the, in the world that has some of the highest percentages of renewable energy. And it also turns out that it has the cheapest electricity in Australia, which isn't too hard to understand because if you're getting your power from wind and solar, you're not buying your fuel on the market. The fuel is coming to you in terms of the wind and the sunshine. And so the prices for electricity in South Australia in 2023, this was the average for the whole year last year, uh, are only 5.5 cents per kilowatt hour. And that's down 24% from the year before. 
And that's because more solar has come online, more batteries have come online. In fact, uh, batteries have doubled in 2023 in Australia. Uh, South Australia has more than 75% renewables in 2023, and that percentage is continuing to rise. And then the other side of the coin, of course, is that the more you're dependent on fossil fuels, the more expensive your power is. And in fact, the, the three states that have the most coal power also had the most expensive power in Australia. And that is uh, Queensland, which has uh, 11.8 cents per kilowatt hour, so more than double, all heading towards triple uh, what off South Australia had. And in fact, that price went up 13% from the year before. Uh, then comes New South Wales, 8.7 cents per kilowatt hour, and Tasmania, 6.7 cents per kilowatt hour. All more uh, expensive than uh, renewables. And it's also important to note once again that Australia is a country which has never had nuclear power. So if nuclear power were being tossed in that mix with the coal, those numbers would be even higher because nuclear is by far the most expensive power. So again, we're looking out for your wealth, your health, and your happiness. And so uh, wealth -er means the less you have to pay for your utilities, the more money you have to spend on yourself and your friends and your pets. Indeed. And so forth. So. Good news from South Australia, their, their, their renewables are increasing and their electricity prices are dropping. So one would think that next we're going to uh, Germany and one would think that therefore it would be natural that all, that all political parties would be pushing for more renewables, wouldn't you think? I mean, because it stands to reason. Ideally, political parties are supposed to be improving the life for their, the people in their countries. However, it has become increasingly clear in Germany that the far right uh, is going in exactly the opposite direction. Uh, there is a story in uh, The Guardian on April 30th by a fellow named Ajit Naranjan, and the title is Far Right Attacks Renewables in Germany. And there's a far, far right party called the AFD, the Alternative for Germany. And the main focus of this party is their, they build themselves as the anti-green party. Oh, great. Yeah. And they claim that they're the party of freedom, while greens are the party of bans, because greens want to ban things like nuclear power and like... Uh, internal combustion engines. Yeah, but there always turns out to be stuff that those people want to ban, too. You <laughs> yeah, know? good point. It's just, yeah. it's it's bad. It's, yeah. Right. Oh, they do want to ban uh, immigration. They don't want uh, any course, more immigrants yeah. into Germany. Uh, they also want to ban vaccinations. <laughs> oh, dear Lord. They're, they're an anti-vax party. Okay. Uh, they're also anti-global warming. Uh, however, they are very much white pride and, oh, and neo-Nazi parties, yeah. yeah. Uh, they, they really are the anti-Greens. <laughs> they really are, because, uh, yeah, one of the Green Party 10 key values is non-violence. Uh, unfortunately, in Germany in 2023, the rhetoric from these uh, far-right parties have led to 1,200 physical attacks on Green Party politicians in 2023. So uh, not only are they uh, dead wrong <laughs> on all their positions, but they're, they're willing to go injure people, you know, go attack people to try to intimidate them, to get them to stop telling the truth, basically, just to stop putting things in the correct direction. So uh, luckily they are still an obnoxious minority. Uh, polls in Germany are still show massive support for green policies and for uh, fighting global warming. And a lot of that was crystallized in Germany back in 2021 by a disaster they had with the R River, AHR, the R River. Mm. Uh, there they had a huge rainstorm. It was seven inches, fell in 72 hours, and it wiped out entire villages. Oh, um, dear. Almost 9,000 homes were destroyed, and 188 people were killed oh my. there in Germany. And that kind of 
crystallized it, that kind of finalized it for, for the vast majority of the German people. They were like, okay, it's real. <laughs> We've got to do something about it. Uh, it's kind of like the flooding in New York City after Hurricane Sandy. You know, if, if you're on the East Coast, Long Island, New York City, you saw with your own eyes, you know, the, the subway tunnels filling up, the houses getting washed away. And, you know, people there have no doubt. So, but it's off in these more remote areas that the AFD, its largest uh, sort of sheltered place is deep inland amongst farmers and people in rural areas who can sort of deny because they haven't like seen it themselves in their own particular area. There's also a huge gender divide here because it turns out that uh, most of the most active greens that these folks are attacking, these guys are attacking are, are young women who are very motivated to try to help fight global warming and, and get into politics because they want to keep and Germany going on its what's called Energy Wind uh, program, which is what got them off of nukes and is what get, is getting them off of coal and off of natural gas and onto 100% renewables. And it turns out most of the got most of the people in this AFD are it's mostly run by guys. That's uh, overwhelmingly uh, a male-dominated party. There's been like a article that's been uh, on you know Facebook, but you have to pay to read it, so I don't. But <laughs> that uh, says something to the effect that in America, um, young men are getting more conservative and young women are getting more liberal. Yeah, well, it's happy to get Germany too. Yep. <laughs> so uh, let's let's pray for the Greens there because. You know, funny, Greens aren't physically attacking AFD people. Uh, yeah, you know, doesn't usually work like that. It's sort of easy to pick on a, a party that has nonviolence as, as one of its 10 key values. So, But, uh, but they're, they are having an influence, they are having an effect. Let's just hope that they uh, don't have much of one in, yeah. when it comes to election time. Next story, back here in Ohio, we're going over to Youngstown. And uh, there's a television station. It's one of the only independent TV stations in the country called WFMJ. And they, on an April 30th story by Madison Tromler, the title is, Ohio Senator Michael Rooley appears to use lobbyists' words to push for natural gas re resolution. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there was a public hearing on uh, September 20th for something called Senate Resolution 121. And that's a resolution that urges uh, all our federal officials, the president, the senators, our, all our representatives, to uh, continue investment in natural gas. And it turns out that uh, a gas industry lobbyist, a fellow by the name of Mitch Given, actually wrote a script <laughs> for this guy. Great. And so when he was testifying in favor of his own bill, uh, he used he got up there and used phrases like, Ohio is a leader in clean energy technology. And you know that's word for word what the uh, lobbyist wrote and <laughs> okay. told them to do. And uh, a professor of politics at University of Cincinnati is quoted in the piece as saying, uh, you know, this makes it appear as though the lawmakers are working for the lobbyists uh, yes, and does. not the taxpayers. Oddly enough, yeah, it does appear that way. Yeah, yeah. and so it is interesting that the, the appearance that this, that bringing it to the fore like this has an impact, an emotional impact greater than the fact that the Ohio legislature pretty much is in the pocket of the gas industry, does whatever they want, yep. which is why, as we heard last week, there's only 1.4% of uh, electricity in Ohio comes from solar, you know, and we have the most restrictive re regulations against wind turbines in the world, which is why we have almost no wind farms. <laughs> So the reality has been there for decades. It's just, it's gotten to the point where the, you know, it used to be your legislator would kind of earn money. It's kind of like copying your your uh, homework for your teacher. You used to actually have to get your sources and then you'd rewrite it in your own words, right? Right, yeah. But if you just copy it straight out, it's plagiarism. Well, they've, they've reached the point of just copying it straight out. They're not even yeah. trying to pretend anymore. So uh, an interesting story. Next story, uh, live science. This was an Earth Day story, April 22nd. Antarctica melting. And the title is, we were in disbelief, in quotes. 
Antarctica is behaving in a way we've never seen before. Can it recover? And it's, we said this was in live science. And it turns out that Antarctic sea ice is vanishing and it might be gone for good. And so what we've been monitoring the Antarctic sea ice using satellites since 1979. And it was declining ever since then, but at a slow, predictable rate, a few percent each year. But then in 2016, it all of a sudden took a huge jump and it reached a record minimum. And since then, several years, and there have been several years where it also reached uh, record minimums. The last record was 2023. So that was the smallest ever Antarctic sea ice. And what's missing from, you know, the comparison of 79 to 2023, approximately a Europe's worth of sea ice is gone. Uh, normally, the sea ice fluctuates during the year from uh, a minimum of about, you know, a million square miles up to about 7 million square miles at the maximum. And unfortunately, like we say, you have to subtract a Europe's worth from the minimum and so we're well below a, a million now. So it's not good. When it's at its maximum, it's supposed to cover about 4% of the Earth's surface. And krill need that sea ice because algae grow on the bottom of it. And the krill eat the algae. And then everything else eats the krill. Everything from uh, penguins to blue whales eat the krill. So if the krill die out because there's not enough uh, sea ice to create enough algae for them to eat, then uh, the whole system can collapse. And, and it's yet another example of the, the most important thing that we've ever talked about on For a Green Future, the thing we talk about almost every week. Positive feedback loop. Positive feedback loop, exactly. Those of you using our show as a drinking game, <laughs> <laughs> yep. go for it. Yep. Bottoms up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, because with this, when the sea ice is there, it reflects uh, sunlight back out into, the, into space. And so that's uh, like a negative feedback loop. The more ice, the less uh, heating. But by getting rid of the ice, now all that sunlight comes in and warms the water. And in fact, uh, the water has increased substantially. The temperature in the 300 to 600 foot level has gone way up since 2016 and has not gone back down. And so what we have now is a positive feedback loop happening in Antarctica which could lead to the complete loss of sea ice and that would lead to the loss of the antarctic glaciers because without the sea ice to stop them they can just slide into the ocean and that would cost us florida and new york and every place like that every place on the coast all right well we're almost done uh just one more story and this story uh it's close to my heart because i live on main street uh, it turns out traffic noise causes lifelong harm to baby birds. Uh, this is an article in Science back on April 25th. And the researchers used zebra finches, uh, which is a bird native to Australia. This research was done in Australia. And what they did was they took the eggs out of the nest and then they played uh, traffic sounds to one group of eggs they played recorded zebra finch songs to another group of eggs, and then they put the other, the third group into silence. And they found that the eggs that were exposed to traffic noises were 20% less likely to hatch. Oh, geez. So that's a huge difference in, in just survivability. Literally, all they did was take them out and, and play noise at them, and that was enough to prevent them from surviving. Um, and the chicks that did uh, hatch out of the noisy eggs. Uh, they were uh, more anemic. They had fewer red blood cells. Mm. Their uh, telomeres are damaged, and those are the those are the the genes at the ends of the chromosomes that determine uh, how many cell divisions you're going to get. In other mm. words, how long you're going to live. Mm. Because the fewer telomeres you have, the shorter your lifespan. Wow. And and in fact, I don't know if you know that that disease where uh, kids age like super rapidly and by the time they're 12 their bodies are basically 80. Paragru something. Yeah yeah that, that disease it looks like is caused by that by having uh, been born with very few telomeres. Uh -oh. So uh, 
So anyway, their telomeres are damaged, and it turns out they only had half as many chicks Ooh. as the, the birds which were exposed to silence or a zebra finch song. Wow. So there's a bunch of people, uh, especially in Bowling Green, that love to roar up and down Main Street. They've modified their their cars and their motorcycles to make as much noise as possible. And uh, just remember, you are actually hurting people because <laughs> because if it hurts the zebra finches, you can be pretty sure it's not too good for humans either. So um, Boy, my aching telomeres. Yeah, go fix your muffler. <laughs> All right, or better yet, switch to an electric car, which doesn't have any engine noise. Yeah, you know, it doesn't. Think about it and. If you switch to an electric car, not only do you get a 30% tax credit this year, but you will be able to out-accelerate all your buddies in their big, noisy gas totally. cars because electric cars just can go faster, faster than Which is what's really combustion. important in life. Exactly. Yeah. So give up the noise and accept the speed. Yeah, exactly. You know, speed is good. All right. Well, that's just about it. Uh, next week, we're working on a story about um, Ninth Circuit Court has a dismissed a lawsuit called Juliana versus the United States. A very important lawsuit. We'll talk about that next week. But that's it for this week. Thank you so much for listening. This is Joe Damar. And Rebecca Wood. And we are signing off. I don't want no oil a spoil in my shoreline. I like fish much better than crud. I like birds and things a creeping and crawling. Won't trade no more oil for blood. The sun don't give us all we need to make this country run. But that black demon oil's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. I don't want them nukes run by them kooks who think radioactivity is fun. No more three-headed frogs or kids with leukemia. Nuclear power ain't fit for a dog. The sun don't give us all we need to make this country run. But that nuclear power's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. No news!